All right, take your Bibles, please turn over to the book of Ephesians, chapter number 6. Ephesians, chapter number 6. Love that song. Thank you, Mrs. Zuber. Ephesians, chapter 6. Ephesians, chapter 6. In verse number 10. All right, verse 10, Ephesians, chapter 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. And in the power of his might. Now, when he says that, finally, what what he is really saying is, for five and a half chapters, what he has done is he has tried to teach them how they can be spiritual. And so now we come, finally, he's saying to, now, in everything that I have taught you, be strong in the Lord and in the power of that might. See, none of anything that I'm going to be preaching this morning is going to do you any good if you're not re- if you don't want to be spiritual. Okay, it's not going to work. And so he goes on here, and uh, let's see, where am I? Verse eleven. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the strategy of the devil. And he does have a strategy. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Principalities are demons that are in charge of, of ge- geographical places. For example, the, the prince of Persia in the book of Daniel. Uh, the prince of Grisha. Uh, there are demons in charge of countries. There's a demon in charge of America. There's a demon in charge of Russia. There's a demon in charge of Saudi Arabia. There's a demon in charge of Iraq and Iran and all Germany, Poland, Italy. God forbid, even Italy. That's so sad to me when I think about it. makes me want to cry. <laughs> and, and, and so these are those. Now then it says, and notice now, against power. Powers are the demons that are trying to get us. They're the ones that are trying to get, what what they are is they seek to manage us. They seek to make us subjects to the devil, even though we're saved. Uh, Next one, and then it says, against the rulers of darkness of this world. These are the demons that are in charge of leaders, that are behind leaders, and influencing leaders. In fact, I've read one book, and they said that they believe that probably behind, for, that there's a demon for every pastor. There's a demon that has been said, this is your pastor, you go after him. Leaders. Okay, and then it says, and, and then it says, where does it say? Uh, spirit, this is it, spiritual wickedness in high places. These are the demons that their job is to uh, push false religions. Spiritual wickedness. You name the false religion, don't name it now, but you name a false religion and there are demons that are pushing false. You ever notice false religions don't need a lot of hype? Uh, uh, Christian science, Scientology. There's demons out there. That's just their job. That's their responsibility. Get people involved in these false religions. Sadly, even Christians. Okay? And then look what it says. Wherefore, take unto you. And then again, he already said it, but he says it again. Because of these different demons and their different responsibilities, he's, try, he's saying again, man, take, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able, may be able to withstand in the evil day. The evil day, listen, everybody, you're going to have an evil day every once in a while. That is when Satan says, or some head demon says, all right, we're going to blitz Joe Grandy on this day. In other words, we're going to, we're going to throw everything at him on this day that we can throw at him on this day. Look it up. It's a special day. And I could give you story after story of Christians who have gone down because they were not ready and they were blitzed. And they fell. And they never came back. Um, Notice now, evil day. uh, Where are we at again? Oh yeah, 13. And and having done, what's that next word? 
all to stand. That means you should be doing everything you can do to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. You, there's no room for half-heartedness in the Christian life. There is no room for mediocrity in the Christian life. The armor of God are for those that are committed. Not halfway. Half in, half out. You're, you're, you're going to get shot, man. You're going to get shot. And I'll show Boy, I can't wait to show you. Amen. Look, look. And it says, all right, now he tells us, stand therefore, now stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Truth, okay? So truth is the, it's the first one. The, 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 the belt of truth. This really is really one of the most important ones because you need the truth of God's word if you're going to stand. And you can't even use the shield of faith if you don't have this girdle of truth on. Because the shield of faith depends on the truth. And, and God has so set us up for the truth. It's beautiful. Jesus is the truth. The Holy Spirit's called the spirit of truth. And the Bible is called the word of truth. And the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. So you need every single one of them. People say, well, the church isn't that important. Are you kidding me? The pillar and ground of the truth? That's why most Christians go to the side, get out of this thing, because they're not going to church. This is where the truth is supposed to be held up, holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither have I labored in vain. Hold up the truth of the Word of God. This is where we do it, right here. And I'm sorry, television does not take the place of church. Uh, CDs or whatever, they're good. I listen to them all the time, but it doesn't. The church ecclesy is a called out assembly. You're called out. Out to a place when we meet together, we're a church. We're a church. And, uh, yeah, thanks, Brother Bill. Man, I'm shaking right now. Woo. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, and having. Yeah, and having on the breastplate of righteous. That's living right, living godly, living holy, living righteous. You cannot stand against the wiles of devils if you're not living right. We talked about that with your conscience. The people that went shipwrecked are the ones that cast aside their faith and a good conscience. Your conscience is what allows you to say, you know what, I, I'm, I'm, I'm living right, I'm doing what I need to do, and the devil can't attack you as much if you're living right. Because he'll, he'll constantly put in your mind thoughts, well, you're no good and you're not this, and he's probably right. Especially if you're not living right. Uh, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance, supplication for all saints. Father, bless this service, please, and speak to hearts through it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be seated. You may be seated. All right, so we're talking about the shield of faith. I already gave you a little rundown. I'm not going to go through it anymore. I mean, every part is important in the armor of God. Absolutely. It is absolutely vital. And we need the armor of God because there are spiritual battles taking place in my life. Everybody's life, you're fighting a spiritual battle. Now, if you ignore it or you're ignorant of it, then you're losing. And so the devil is real. Amen? Devil's real. First book I ever read as a new Christian was The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. Very first Christian book I ever read. Second book I read was also by Hal Lindsey, and it was Satan is Alive and Well. Satan's Alive and Well. And I tell you what, I think those are two of the best books I could have read as a new Christian. Late Great Planet Earth showed me Jesus is coming back. And it got me all stirred about the coming Lord as a brandy new Christian. But then the second one showed me, as a new Christian, I have an enemy. And he's alive and well. And, and, and I, when I think back to those days, boy, it opened my eyes to the things that were going to happen to me as a new Christian. 
and the fiery darts that Satan was going to shoot at me in the military. And boy, he shot him. But I was ready because I read about him and I read about the armor of God. Though I didn't know everything about it, I was ready. And I learned that Satan is real. And so one of the things he says that we need to take up is we need to take up the shield of faith. Remember what I said. Now, the shield of faith, he says, take up. That means that you may not always need the shield of faith as far as in your life. Like when we would be out there in maneuvers or something, and uh, I never went to real war. But if we did, if we, if we did, uh, we went out to maneuvers, there were times we could take a break. Well, I'd, I'd put my M16 down and take my helmet off and I'd relax. But as soon as we got up to get back out there, grab my M16 and, and, and grab my helmet and went out there. And that's the idea. When you sense that you are being attacked and you will be attacked, that's when you say, oh, man, I better get that shield of faith. Oh, I better get my shield of faith, huh? What's going on with me here? Yeah, get that shield of faith up there, right? And by the way, Paul knew how soldiers dress, what they had on. He saw their shields. This is actually a shield. This is just the way. Isn't it pretty? I told you, man, if you look at the shield of faith online, it's just this beautiful thing. That's not how it was. You want a shield of faith as big as possible. And it was two, two and a half feet by four and a half feet. And so why? So you it goes to the first point. Because this shield is a covering. It's not meant to look nice. It's a cover so you can get behind. Brother, listen, I need a, I need a devil and some darts. Come on down here, Brother Bill. So, fire only when I tell you, please. <laughs> so, there were two, two, there were two shields. The one shield was a little round one, like a giant frisbee. That was for hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's what, to, to stop, to keep when they're doing the sword and they're fighting you. That would help to block that. But when it came to going out into the battle, they had this shield right here. Usually front liners are the ones that had this. Because when, when they would go out there, the, the, the enemy would have these darts, and actually they're arrows, and, and they would throw these darts with fire on them at them, and what they would do is they would get behind it, and they needed something that could be big enough to cover them completely. So they get behind it, and then they'd shoot it. Oh, come on. Oh, oh, yes, yes. Now, they'd block all those fiery darts, this shield. Could you imagine going out into the battle and not having the shield of faith? You'd be in trouble. You'd get shot. And I'm not talking about little bitty darts. I'm talking about arrows with fire on them. And it was meant to go out there and cover. And that, by the way, and if you ever watch any good old movies back in the, for those, that time period, they would have army and they would all get together, wouldn't they? They'd line up like this. And then when they shot, they would all get behind and have a wall here. And then there'd be a second group that would be above them. And they'd put it like that at the top of that one. And then they'd protect it from the arrows coming down upon them. And that's what Paul is saying. Listen, above all, not that it is the, the, the most important thing of all, but above all of that, you've got to have this shield to cover you. That's, and that's why you need the church. And that's why you need each other. To protect each other. Hey, listen, striving together is what Paul said. Amen. Striving together. And so this shield of faith was so important, so needed in their life. And my friend, you are in a battle every day. You don't know what days he is going to blitz you. But I guarantee you, it's coming. Amen. It's coming, every single one of us. How many think, man, I remember when I've been blitzed. Brother, I've been blitzed a lot. And if it wasn't for the shield of faith, I wouldn't even be here today. So it was a covering. Number two, number two. So much I could say there. Number two, not only is it a covering, it is our confidence. Okay, it's our confidence. Look at verse 16 again. 
above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith we shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, or the idea being the wicked one, the devil, Satan, Lucifer. All right? Now, the shield not only covered, protected them, but the shield was given to them so they would have confidence to go out into the battle. See, the armor of God and the shield of faith was never made for people running away. There really isn't any protection for the back of you as a child of God. It's all forward. And that's why it says, and the gates of hell, talking about the church, shall not prevail against it. If the church is going forward with the armor of God and the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit and praying as they go, there is nothing that can stop us. I'm talking about individually, if we're really exercising the armor of God as we should be exercising the armor of God, there's nothing that can stop us. Nothing. And that shield of faith is really kind of the, the thing that keeps it all. It's like double protection. All right, you, you've got that, that the breastplate of righteousness. That helps. And that covers the vital parts of your body. But this is important because it protects everything. It protects all of it. And it will quench all the fiery darts of the devil. So many times, the enemy would take an arrow, they'd put pitch, they'd put tar on it, they'd shoot it at the Roman legions. The Roman legions would then take up the shield and, they, and cover themselves with the shield. And that arrow would come down or many arrows would come down. Remember what I told you? Sometimes they'd have as many as 100 to 200 arrows in their shield. And eventually, the fire would be snuffed out the, the, the arrows would be quenched, and then guess what they did? They got up and they attacked. They would go forward, and they would fight the battle, and it gave them the confidence they needed to, to get into the battle, to fight the good fight of faith. You cannot fight the good fight of faith without the shield of faith. And by the way, our, I'm glad our shield is not a piece of wood or a piece of metal. Sometimes they were made out of metal. I'm glad my shield and your shield is a shield of faith, which is a reminder of how important faith is. Friend, faith is huge in the Christian life. It is so huge in our Christian life. In fact, the Christian life is all about faith. You don't come to Jesus except by faith. Yeah, by grace are you saved, but it's through what? Faith. It's faith. And then you do not, you do not, and you cannot live the Christian life except by faith. There's no other way to live a victorious Christian life than by faith. Three times, four times in the Bible, one is in the Old Testament, Three are in the New Testament where it says, for example, Romans 1.17, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Which, by the way, is continuous action. So the idea is, I am living every day faith to faith to faith to faith to faith. I'm constantly walking in faith every day. Faith, faith, faith. And then it goes on to say, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Three times it says that. Galatians 3.11, Hebrews 10.38, and the word live means to breathe. How many think it's important to breathe every second or two? You breathe spiritually by faith. It means to enjoy Real life. Just look it up in your Strong's Concordance to enjoy real life. It means to, to have true life. And I'm going to tell you something. The, 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 the life that you can live out in that world, that is not life. That is not living. You know, somebody gets up on Sunday morning, partying Saturday night, and they say, boy, I had a great time, but they spent most of their time around the toilet. You say, how do you know that? None of your business. 
And the most important thing of, of, of all about faith, you cannot please God but by faith. That's how you please God, by faith. What is not of faith is sin. Hebrews 11.6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. Listen, and, and he really gives us insight into faith right now. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So it gives us insight into the shield of faith. If you're going to wield the shield of faith, three things you've got to believe. Number one, you've got to believe God is real. And I don't just mean, yeah, amen, but do you really believe God is real? Be careful how you answer that. I mean, Christians say, I believe God is real. Well, tell your life. Your life doesn't show me that you believe there's a real God. If, if, I mean, come on. If we really believed there was God, a lot of Christians would change their living. They say they believe God, but a lot of them practice atheists. They don't really live like that. So you've got to believe that he is real. Not only that, but he says that he is a rewarder. So you have to believe that God is good. God's good. Man. Not only that, of them that diligently seek him. So, and then you believe that God is good to those that really seek him and trust him. That's what it means about wielding the shield of faith. It means, it means, when I wield the shield of faith, like I should wield the shield, the shield of faith, here's what I'm saying. When I put that thing up, I'm saying I believe God is real. And not only that, but I believe God is good. And not only that, I believe God will be good to me and reward me if I diligently seek him and trust him. Amen. That's what it means to yield, a wield. The shield of faith. So important. It says in 2 Timothy 2, 3, because we are in spiritual warfare about this thing. Faith allows us to please God. It says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that wars entangle himself with the affairs of this life. See, we've got to be careful about getting too caught up in this old world. I'm sorry, but if you're caught up in this world, you're probably not learning to, to hold up that shield of faith like you should. But he says this, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. See, the only way we can please God is a soldier, and that's what we all are, by the way. Every one of you are enlisted. The day you got saved, you became a soldier of Jesus Christ. The question is, as he says there, is are you a good soldier of Jesus Christ? Are you a good soldier? There's no question that you're a soldier, but are you, and anybody who's been in the military, you got your good ones and your bad ones. you got your ones that are serious and the ones that are just playing games. And the question is, are you serious about being a soldier for Jesus Christ. And the shield of faith is what gives us the confidence to fight the spiritual battles that we are facing. Hebrews eleven six 6 teaches us the shield of faith is believing God, trusting God, having faith in God. And the substance of the Christian life is, again, believing that God is real, believing that God is good, and believing that God will reward those that diligently seek Him and trust Him. That's the substance of the Christian life. How many would agree that I'd rather have the shield of faith than the shield of wood? And we have the shield of faith. It's available. And those Roman soldiers would go, go to battle with, with confidence and they'd run out there and they'd fight that battle and they'd use that shield. I wondered this morning, how are you using the shield of faith? Are you using it? I read about Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was a very famous poet and author, and he said, in talking about being successful in life, he said, it is faith in something that makes life worth living. Uh, that sounds good, but it's not true. Faith in something is not going to make you a success. 
It is the object of your faith that determines whether or not you are going to be a success in your life. I, I, I read about that, that little leaguer, that boy, and, and he's getting ready to go play the game, and his mom's getting ready, and the little boy goes up to the mom and says, Mom, he says, Mom, I, I, I think we're going to lose the game today. And the mom said, No, 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 son. Think positively. And the little boy replies, Okay, Mom. I'm positive that we are going to lose the game today. You know, that little boy was pretty smart, actually. I'm sorry. Positive thinking is not going to win any battles for you. That is not the way. The only way that you can win the battles of the Christian life and be the Christian that you have, you've got to put your faith in something or someone that is worthy of that faith, and the someone is Jesus Christ, and the something is the power of God. So the shield of faith, it's not just a token and get up and I just say, yeah, folks, put the shield of faith. We'll see it tonight. I'm sorry, we need a lot more than that. We need to understand how does this work, because I think a lot of Christians don't really understand the shield of faith and how it works and how we actually use the shield of faith. And if I said to you, how do you use the shield of faith? You probably would say, well, I just trust the Lord. Yeah, well, that's certainly part of it. But it, it, it's a little bit more, I don't want to say complicated, a little bit more complex. It's more than just trusting him. So that certainly is it. Oh, when the missionary John Payton was translating the Bible for a tribe in the South Seas, he found, he found they had no word for the word faith. And so one day, a native who had been running hard came into John Patton's home, flopped down in a large chair, and said, it's good to rest my whole weight on this chair. You know, Wiley Coyote, light bulb comes on. Ding! Hey, that's it! And so he, John Patton immediately said, that's it! I'll translate faith as resting one's whole weight on God. And my friend, the shield of faith is for us to completely trust God with all of our life. Not just increments of our life, certain parts of our life. It doesn't work that way. You need to use the shield of faith for all of your life. You need, to, you need to rest all your life on the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the song says, my faith has found a resting place. Not in device or creed. I trust the ever living one. His wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. That's what faith has to be in. And so the question then begs us. What are the darts? What are these fiery darts that Satan is shooting at us? I, I, I believe all the time. I believe it's all the time. What are they? What, what is their purpose? Well, first of all, because it is a shield of faith, it just makes sense that the purpose of this, these fiery darts is to throw at us as believers seducing temptations to get us to not believe God. To get us to doubt God. And in getting us to doubt God, he gets us to sin. It's not, I said complex, in, in, in a way it really isn't complex. The devil is going to tempt you and, and really, almost directly or indirectly, every temptation is to seduce you and to get you and me to doubt God, to not believe God. Um, so the, the, the fiery darts are darts that actually, they get into your mind. L look at, if you would please, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 4. They get into your mind. They get you. Uh, the devil wants you to, to plant a thought, to plant a desire in you so that he can get you, listen, to believe him and to not believe God. 
That's what he wants to do. He does not want you to believe God. He wants you to doubt God. He wants you to, 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 to doubt the Bible. Look at, look at Paul throughout his epistles gives us insight into this spiritual battle. And this is one of the greatest two verses concerning the spiritual battle. Notice, it's very easy to understand. It says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That means it's not real swords and, and, and real shields and, and real armor that you would put on, a physical type of thing. No, it's not that. Uh, it's are not carnal. But notice now, but mighty through God to the pulling down of what? strongholds Cat, now he gives us tells us what we we need to learn if we're going to fight this battle notice casting down imagination that means thoughts that you get into your mind and 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 things that start going through your mind he said you got to learn to cast throw the word cast down means throw it down get rid of that thing and then he says and every high thing that exalteth itself against the what? Knowledge of God. The last thing the devil wants is, number one, for you to believe God. Number two, to have knowledge of God. He doesn't want you to know him. He doesn't want you to know him. Paul said, I know whom I have believed. Did you get that? I know whom I have believed and am persuaded. 1 Timothy 1.12 And am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him. That's not just salvation, friend. He isn't even talking about salvation there. He's talking about he was going through suffering. He was going through persecution. And he said, and as he goes through it, Paul learned. And we won't get to it this morning. I want to get to it this morning. But we won't. Paul was saying, listen, I am suffering. I've been through a lot of things. But Paul says, but I know whom I have believed. In other words, Paul says, I know I have the shield of faith. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep. What was Paul saying? Paul was saying, I am not going to believe the lies of the devil. I'm going to believe God. I'm going to believe there's a God in heaven. And I'm going to believe there's a God that is good up in heaven. And I'm going to believe that if I will seek him and trust him and depend upon him and believe in him, he will reward me. Isn't that good? It's all about believing God. It it sounds so basic. But you know what? A lot of times, you know what? When we went in the military, you know we had basic training. Just basic training. Who is it? Ruth here's son's going through boot camp right now, and I pray for him, and I'm thinking about him. I know what he's going through. And nitpicky things. Nitpicky. Nitpicky. I, you know, I told her, I said, I remember our raincoat. We had to fold our raincoat a certain way. Who cares? Just fold it up. And then you have a string you've got to tie around it. And you've got to have a certain knot. It can't be any knot. It has to be a square knot. And then, not only that, but, uh, it's okay, folks. <laughs> I've got the shield of faith. Amen. <laughs> and, and then, you've got to put it in your, in your uh, locker a certain way. Certain way has to be a certain way. Can't just throw it in there. Certain way, and then not only that, but then the the ends you got to turn them and put them underneath that that string, and then it has to go a certain direction. So we'll say it has to go this way. If they come up and they see it going this way, you're out. Right. You're out. They're going to take everything in your in your uh, locker, locker throw and throw it upside down. You say, oh, that's nitpicky stuff. You know what? They're trying to get rid. You need to pay attention to details. Amen. You need to pay attention to detail. See, the problem with Christians is we don't pay attention to details. Right. Right. Exactly. We, a lot of Christians, you know what they need? They don't need the complex stuff. They just need to know the basics. Amen. I'm talking about reading your Bible and praying and coming to church. Yeah. 
using your spiritual gift for the Lord. A lot of Christians just haven't even learned the basics yet. And really, this is, not, this is the basic thing. Boy, for a soldier, probably one of the most basic things is get your flak jacket, man. Get your boots on. Get your helmet. Get your M16. And get out there and fight. That's basic. 101, soldiering. And basic 101 Christianity is get your helmet on, Christian. Get your, get, your, uh, get your breastplate of righteousness on, Christian. Get your, get your girdle of truth on, Christian. Get your shield of faith up, Christian. Get your, get your sword, Christian. Get your, sword, get your shield, Christian. And pray and go out there and fight. Amen. And win the battles in your life. Because some of you are losing. You're losing it. See, the fiery darts that Satan... He's trying to get your mind. Let me give you an example. Remember, Jesus is teaching about uh, the cross, and he's going to die. Go to the cross. He's going to rise again. Well, you know what? Probably the greatest of all those 12 was who? Peter. Peter was the leader. The devil always wants to go after the leader first. You know who the devil wants to go in your, your family with your kids? Firstborn. He wants the firstborn. You say, why? Because the firstborn is going to set the pace for the other ones. He always wants the firstborn. Yeah. When the plagues came, who was the one that died? The firstborn. There's something to the firstborn. Firstborn can be a tremendous leader, can be a tremendous example for the other kids. I'm getting sidetracked. Where was I? Peter. Peter. And lo and behold, guess what Peter did? Get this, folks. This blows me away. Peter rebuked the Lord. He rebuked him. I can't imagine ever. Now, Lord, let me tell you something. That's what Peter did. Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're the Lord. I understand that. But you are not going to die. We're not going to let it happen. You know what Jesus said? Did he say, Peter? Say, who in the world planted such a stupid thought? Did that come from Peter? It came from the devil. You know why you do some of the dumb things and sinful things you do? Because some thought was planted. An arrow was shot at you. And he put it in your mind. And see, what the devil wants is he wants you to believe. He wants you to believe that. You know, one of the things we're seeing more in Christianity than we've ever seen is Christian young people marrying somebody who's unsaved. It happens all the time. And you think, what are they thinking? Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. Yet so many Christian young people are dating and marrying someone who isn't saved and someone who isn't of like faith. I'm sorry, I'm a Baptist. I wouldn't suggest that my children marry somebody that is in a totally different faith and a totally different direction. That's just me. I wouldn't want them to do that, but the, the thoughts. And so the devil... The devil throws that. Here's this young girl. And boy, he's such a hunk. Boy, he's so, and he's so nice. So nice. And and I I know he's not a Christian, but, but I could change him. I can change him. I can make him a good Christian. Man, you can't make nobody a good Christian. God has to make him a Christian, but it sure would help if they were Christian first. And so, you do that, and you, okay, young person, if any of you, you're, not, you're single, and you get tempted, you meet a pretty girl, and she's, man, she's pretty. Boy, she's so sweet, but she's unsaved. And you think, well, again, same thought. Can I tell you something what the devil does? He throws a dart at you, and he says to you, ah, just go ahead and date her anyways. 
And what happens is you believe that. Can I tell you something, folks? You need to believe God. You need to believe the word of God. And so every temptation the devil throws at you, it's a fiery dot. He plants this thought. He plants this desire. I, 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 you say, what are some of the fiery dots? He'll, he'll plant fear in your heart. Man, he'll throw, you, throw it at you and put fear in your heart. And then when fear comes in your heart, you have to ask yourself, who am I going to believe? Am I going to believe God or am I going to believe the devil? Who am I going to believe? God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. And I'm telling you, every temptation you have, it is, it is, it, it is a choice. It is a choice between is God, is God, do you believe God or do you believe the devil? Do you believe the lie or do you believe the truth? Oh my goodness, fiery dart, the fiery dart of impurity, of immorality. Young ladies, giving up your purity. Young men, giving up your purity. Because that's what just everybody does. Or I'll, I think I'll live with her, I'll live with him. And you believe the lie. That's the devil's lie. He says it's okay. Don't worry about what God says. That adulterers and warmongers will be judged. But the marriage bed is undefiled. Are you folks okay with all this? Amen. It doesn't matter if you are or anyways. <laughs> I'm going to tell you anyways. Do you, are you getting, I'm not done. I'm going to finish next week. Because this is too much. Too many great illustrations and verses. All these darts he throws at you. Selfishness, being selfish. Yeah, we fought that one, amen? Yeah, take that one, buddy. I'm talking about the dart of disappointment, the dart of lust. Devil says, go ahead and look at pornography. You can handle that. But forget about what God says. Forget about that when a man looketh upon a woman and lusteth after her, he has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Just go ahead. Boy, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm going to tell you what happens. What happens is he keeps throwing those darts at you and at you. And I'm going to tell you what, when you give in, then you're going to sin. And then the more you do that sin, then you are going to give the devil ground. You're going to give him ground. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. The word place is ground. I'm not saying when you sin at one time that you've given him ground, but the goal of the devil, he'll keep throwing. Listen, he knows what can get you. He knows what you can, and he keeps saying, I mean, he sees patterns in your life. And he's going to keep throwing them out there. Why? Because he wants you to keep sinning. Because he wants some ground. And then what he wants is a building permit. Because he knows that if he can stay on that ground long, by the way, and I just read this this week. This is so good. The devil's already lost. Whatever the devil has of mine and yours, it's because you gave it to him. He can't take nothing from you, man. And the problem with us, we give it to him. Yeah, he throws that old fiery dart at us, and you believe him. Yeah, I don't need church. And you believe it. But God says, hey, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. See, every temptation comes down. Do you believe God? Or do you believe the devil? And if you keep giving in, what's going to happen is that's when the stronghold comes. He builds on the property. Because you let him have the property. And you keep giving in. So he says, man, I might as well build something while I'm here. Look up the word stronghold. The castle. The castle. The devil says, man, hey, if you want to take somebody, build a house next to him. Doesn't that make sense? The devil's not a dummy. Build a, I can build a house on Joe Grandy's property. That I can be there all the time. 
And that kind of all this influence in his life because he's a pastor. I want to take him down and take you down. It all boils down to 1 Timothy 2.16. He's, he, and I ha- didn't reread them all. I mean the dart of covetousness and hurt. Hurt. Boy, you get hurt. Somebody says something, and he takes a dart, and he throws it at you, and he says, get bitter at him. Throws a dart. Get angry at him. Throws a dart. Keep it in your heart. Get, get it so you get a whole bunch of good malice in there. Wrath and anger and bitterness. See, the question always is, do you believe God or do you believe the devil? But it always boils down to 1 Timothy 2.16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. See, the devil wants to draw out of you ungodliness, unrighteousness, and he knows if I can throw that dart at him and he doesn't hold up that shield of faith, man, I can get him. I can begin to draw out of him the things that is going to take him down. Remember in the book of Proverbs, it talks about how the man that sinned, nobody can bind him. He binds himself by his own cords. And then you, and, and then you think, I can't get out of here. Well, that's because you let the devil wrap all those ropes around you. And now, listen. Now he has a stronghold on your life. Can I, get, can I break down the stronghold? Hallelujah, glory to God. Yes, you can. But I got to tell you something. You're going to have to meet. You're going to have to purpose in your heart. It's a big deal to break down a stronghold. Are you all with me tonight, this morning? I feel like it's tonight already. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Let's bow for prayer. Father, help us, Lord. I know I didn't finish the message, but I believe I gave enough to get everybody thinking. And really, Lord, I'm trying to help Faith Baptist Church be soldiers for Christ, good soldiers. I'm trying to help them to learn about the shield of faith so that they can quench every single fiery dart and so, Lord, help every one of our, in our church to say, I believe God. I'm not going to believe the lies that the devil wants a plant or a demon wants a plant in my heart or in my mind. And give us, Lord, give us as a church, as individuals, victory. The victory that only comes by faith. Faith is the victory as we sang. And so help us, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Heads about, let's all stand together, please. Heads about, eyes are closed. I wondered this morning, would you say after hearing the preaching this morning, man, oh man, I've got to get that shield of faith. I've got to take that shield of faith.